But the, mu the idea is the music is quality enough and the illustrations are fun enough that a whole family can enjoy it. So the idea was kind of to bring the idea of family entertainment to Austria originally because we found that there's a real kind of, there's a wonderful classical music scene and there's children's you know events and there's not a whole lot where everyone is going to have a good time. <laughs> Hi, Rima and uh, Chanda. So lovely to meet you here on Zoom. So nice to meet you as well. Nice to meet you. Yeah. And you've got this amazing project, and now you have to tell me everything about this, please. <laughs> Great. Well, um, yeah, the project is called Tailspin, Musical Tales for Big and Small. And it's actually one of the longest kind of musical projects I've personally worked on. I co-founded it back, I think, in 2007 was when I was at conservatory with another violinist. I'm a pianist. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to find a way to really bring quality kind of classical music, um, like feature modern composers um, uh, who write classical music and combine it with storytelling and, um, and bring in a really great visual kind of art into a concert series. So that's what we start to do is we start to find, I think storytelling is kind of a, a really wonderful way to reach people. I think we understand the world through, through narratives and through stories. So the idea was to go and find kind of stories from different places in the world um, that mean a lot in a specific place, but maybe aren't so well known outside of it. And then to kind of rework them and make them into this kind of musical and artistic um, presentation. So we we actually now have seven or eight stories that we've done this with. We um, we have one from Trinidad. We have one from Iceland. Um, and uh, we performed them in concerts for quite a while. And then we started thinking, you know, we should publish some of these. We should turn them into an actual physical thing. So it's not just we play a concert and a festival and then leave and, and there's nothing to kind of hang on to. Um, so in 2019, we brought out our first book and CD and it was called, I have it here, yeah. How, How Monkey Looks for Trouble. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and it's, um, we did, it's, a, it's this one's for little kids. It's about seven or eight minutes in, in, in length and we have a wonderful Turkish um, artist who made these beautiful illustrations. And it's a tale from Trinidad, and it's about this monkey who goes um, and he sees a woman who's walking with some cake, and she falls and trips and she spills them everywhere. And she goes, Oh, look at all the trouble I have. Now I have to go back home. And he tastes them and says, Oh, this trouble is so delicious. And then runs off and, and looks for trouble. And finds uh -huh. So, so we did that. We, um, we crowdfunded it successfully. We got the Bank Austria Kunstpreis. And then we brought it out. We released it um, in a sold out show at the Musikverein in 2019. Wow. And I think a little bit bigger because um, we have a, a much longer, much more involved story, um, which is kind of a reworking of Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. But it centers um, a female character who is actually present, I think, in all the, all the versions, but she's usually kind of a side figure. She's the servant and she's smart and um, in our version, she kind of sees through all the plots against Alibaba and his family and, and saves the day several times, saves his life several times. And it's a story for older kids. Um, it's more like 20, 25 minutes long. I think around 22 and a half is actually where it, where it ticks off. Um, and we're going to bring out a huge hardcover book with about uh, 50 pages, over 50 pages. And Rima here is the illustrator we've been working on this project with for ages. Mm -hmm. um, and she's made some of the most beautiful designs for it because um, uh, Rima is Austrian Iraqi and she um, does art. Well, you can talk by yeah. yourself. <laughs> yeah. She's an artist celebrating her, her heritage, but it's beautiful. But first, but first I want to ask, so, so these stories, are they sort of like folk stories or is it children's stories? Or what, what are the ages of... It, they're they're at, for different ages, obviously. Monkey is for a very um, young population. We've done it for kindergartners, for Volkschulkinder. Um, but the, the idea is the music is quality enough and the illustrations are fun enough that a whole family can enjoy it. So the idea was kind of to bring the idea of family entertainment to Austria originally because we found that there's a real kind of, there's a wonderful classical music scene and there's children's you know events. And there's not a whole lot where 
everyone is going to have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Alibaba is for, for older kids. There's, you know, um, there is some violence. It's not the most, um, uh, you know, it's not quite as, as, as little kid friendly, but my daughter who's, who's nine loves it. So I would say any kids above seven, it'd be perfectly appropriate all the way to adults. And one of the really nice things that, um, that Rima had, uh, Rima came up with and, and suggested that we're going to do then is um, kind of in the interest of cultural communication and, 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 and literacy and understanding. Every picture in the book, um, she's taken an Arabic word that kind of uh, encapsulates it, like Medina is a city, right? And then she, we put the Arabic um, uh, writing of that word that, um, and then uh, write how to phonetically pronounce it, translate it in different languages, and then kind of give a little bit of cultural context. So honestly, it's a book that I would buy as an adult. Um, yeah. Kind of out of interest, yeah. But, yeah, and and but where did you find the stories or what um, inspired the stories? Different things. The first story is an Icelandic folktale. Uh, the first, the very first one I ever did, and it was with an Icelandic violinist that I originally started this project. And it's a story that everybody, it's a folktale that everybody knows in Iceland and no one outside of Iceland has ever heard of. So yes, folktales, folk legends. Um, that's the first one we did. Then we just, I mean, looked into different collections, collected books of folktales. Every time I travel, I try to find local stories, go to local bookstores and just talk to people. Um, so we've gotten them, the actual stories from a variety of different places mm -hmm. and actually probably more jhana is the most mainstream story I think that we've done because people kind of know about, you know, a thousand and one Arabian nights and Alibaba mm -hmm. and the cave, but it is a, I think an original take on it. And I like mm -hmm. focusing on a female protagonist. Um, yeah. So Rima, tell me about the, the artwork that you do for these. Yes, I was very thrilled already in 2009 when we first did the, uh, I was asked to, to participate with the illustration. And it was a very challenging thing for me because usually I'm, I'm an art designer, an architect, and I paint on porcelains. So that was my first, and I do aquarelles and sketches. Wow, oh, beautiful. Thank you. And this was my first work or uh, work I was doing for um, for a story and for children. Mm -hmm. and, uh, having uh, the fact that it's uh, Alibaba, this was the, the difficult fact, uh, uh, part of it because there was uh, those uh, scenes like, uh, yeah, the, the killing of his brother and the, the whole stories with the thieves. So um, it's, I really enjoyed it, <laughs> it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, now after 13 years, <laughs> we, <laughs> I, came, I came back to work again uh, on this story. And first we thought we will add a couple of scenes, but then when I found out that the Rima who did the first version is not the same Rima doing this one, so we decided to change all the illustrations into new ones. So I hope she did some beautiful be, ones. She brought a couple to the sketches to show. It will be yeah. as successful as the first one. This oh, that is summarized beautiful. a little bit oh. the idea of Jana. Wow. And, and the colors are so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's been really fun to see Rima's evolution as an artist, too, because, of course, we're all constantly changing and that kind of thing, but this is just... Oh, beautiful. wow. This is, yes. Beautiful. But isn't it amazing that you come from not an illustrator, so, you, so you're not really an illustrator, but uh, and, and yet you go into that field... And you bring something from your art because then also, you know, it's it's you bring something from what you were doing into this story. I find this fascinating. This is wonderful. And this is something you know? we want to do from the beginning is to have each story have a different illustrator or a different artist who's making. So people work in very different 
fields. We have one story from Thailand and the woman who did the illustrations for that are, are not illustrations. They're actually like slow computer animation almost. So she works kind of in computer design and graphic design. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's lovely just to have kind of this really different framing. And I do think that Prima's perspective and how she yeah. sees three dimensions really plays into yeah. how she's approached this project. It's been wonderful. It's the, yeah. the thinking of an architect. That's, this is the foundation of, of any work I do. So from this base, I move in, in different directions. So you always find mm -hmm. somewhere a hint that, yeah. yeah and, the third and, view and and I feel like one thing that I really appreciate particularly about Rima is that because probably because of the architectural background she thinks functionally all the time so to come up with the idea of using symbols um within the picture yeah. you know it's the 40 feet so she uses the Arabic symbol for 40 and can write you know a couple of them and really encapsulate a lot of information in a way that's clear and kind of culturally appropriate um, also, the idea again of the of, of the Arabic word, the kind of cultural context, the learning corners. I just I think it's absolutely brilliant. But uh, this is why I'm saying I immediately in your pictures also saw movement. You know, this it's it the the shapes and the the lines that you use it it creates sort of a movement there, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it's beautiful. But now what, what, how did you evolve? Because it's been such a great, uh, you know, such a long period of time. So how did you evolve as an artist in that, Rima? Well, uh, I usually, because I didn't stop working on my art uh, since uh, 95, when, when I really moved from doing architectural drawing to to small pieces of porcelain that started first as gifts and then became a, a whole full-time profession. Um, I never thought that it could be so different, my work, because I had always the feeling I was doing the same, or I mean, I get inspired, I get, uh, I see what the, the client's wishes are or my inspirations, and I try to implement them on, on the work I do. But when you have such a long time gap and you look back, then I really discovered that, yeah, there is a lot of, of uh, maybe more, yeah, of course, more mature, but also more, there is more self-confidence in the, in the work. Yeah, it's very really playful, yes. I think. So, so it's, bright it's, colors. Yes, and, yeah. it's, uh, it's more, there is more daring in, in, what's, in what I, uh, I, do, I do now in comparison. Yeah to what I used to, or how I used to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think in, in art, sometimes you define yourself as, I am an architect and, and you do this porcelain work. And then suddenly somebody says, well, illustrate, then you have to redefine yourself again, you know? And I think that maybe that's that's what you're talking about, this confidence thing that you bring up. And, yeah. A couple of years ago, I created this word for myself because I always, when somebody asks me, what are you or what do you really do now? I'm, I, learned, I'm, I was an architect. I'm not an architect anymore. I, I'm not an artist either because I didn't study. Uh, uh, the, I didn't go to, to art school. But so I created this art designer with a T that includes the our architect and the art. Uh, the artist and the designer and the artisan because I work with my hands so this is my <laughs> my own word well Rima just the, just the fact that you invented a word for it makes you an artist the functionality of everything everything that Rima does is kind of about filling space and kind of experiencing the place that you inhabit the, the place that you live in these different ways. So she made, she makes, um, she made this just from Morjana. This is the Morjana charm. Yeah, a beautiful. A little, yeah, there's a little, um, oh, where is the thing in the back? Let's see if I can show you this. And and it's like, you can, I mean, you can wear it, but, but you can, it can be a bookmark. You can put it just on a kind of a plate of tea or whatever. And it's, 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 I'm like, what is it? How do we describe it? She's like, it's yeah. a charm. It's a charm. It just, it's there. You use it however, Make, you can hang it on the wall. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, she made this own one too. It's it's, this one, 
this one also and the the glass this is the porcelain work i do with my hand for this one mm -hmm. i have molds i have a, a, a porcelain shop they do it for me and this is glass work it's also my wow. my doing and on the back side it doesn't show very well but there is writing usually i don't have uh, front sides and back sides even yeah. my plates or my cups you can always turn them on the back side and you find some some small word or poetry or quote or mm -hmm. yes yeah, so. amazing that's amazing and how much did the music inspire you to when you did the drawings or did it was it just the story it the the music came after the 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 story mm -hmm. but but the music is is uh, an essential part to to the whole the whole inspiring especially also the the re refrains and the yeah. the storytelling along with the music mm -hmm. to it it's it's the whole the whole um, atmosphere yeah, yeah. And we haven't recorded it yet because that's what we're yeah. we're, we're going to do um in september but uh the music is by a really wonderful uh, composer who's Canadian American. His name's Jason Gray. And he actually spent a lot of time listening to traditional kind of Middle Eastern instruments like the kanun and the santor, some kind of these stringed instruments. So part of the beginning, I kind of play with soft mallets inside the piano to kind of mimic that and, and string a soft mallet across the strings inside. Um, it's 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 wonderful work. He's he's absolutely fabulous. I'm very excited about um, the quality of the music as well. Because again, yeah. I, I think that I think whether this is for adults or for children, I don't think we can really decide. But I don't think that kids need bad music <laughs> or bad. Yeah. Or, like, you don't need to condescend to to children, you know. But you or, know, I yeah, I think um uh, I've spoken to many artists during the time of the pandemic um and. We talked about the fact that art, you know, the, the, how art is valued. And it always brought me back to this question, shouldn't we involve children more into art and, and have them, you know, either take part mm -hmm. so that they can appreciate then art because they will be the next, um, the, the audiences, you know, they will be the future audiences. Now, while you were talking, I was thinking this is actually – exactly the thing that i think that that should be done you know mm -hmm. it 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 involves not just the children like you say it involves a family and it's something that can be listened to at home and and i think it's not just that we say art should be taught in schools or music should be taught in schools but it should also be part of family life family life as well because many years ago it was you know a, families would sing together or they would play instruments together and now it's changed so much and and something like this project that really stimulates so many um senses isn't it you know that that this is absolutely fantastic for for projects i think that the storytelling aspect also really helps I yeah. think it helps anybody honestly to get um to have a program or some sort of story to connect with classical music. And I know several years ago, I was on tour in India um, and I was actually with a, another pianist and we, um, and one of the, she, she does a series of concerts throughout, throughout India and did, did for years, a lot of kind of cultural outreach. And she said, you know, a, a lot of the things that we kind of hold up, um, you know, in, in, in the US or in, in Western Europe as kind of these universal uh pieces she's like mozart and that can they they find it boring they don't like it so it is conditioning what what teaches us and um what what we appreciate and what we love and she said you know anything though with a story anything with like kind of a theater tradition that's much easier to 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 bring across and so she asked actually if we could try to arrange some of the music um and then we we did and we had a, um, a we worked with a speaker locally uh, who did it in a couple of different local languages and and it came over beautifully and so that was wow. a really kind of surprising um manifestation of, of 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 tailspin in a very very different way but i do think the power of storytelling and narrative is much more universal than any kind of one musical piece yeah i should also mention rima had the great idea before i forget of um talking about languages she said you know we brought out the last book in english german and french 
And she said, well, we should bring this one up for sure in Arabic as well. So yeah. we are um, we are recording it in English, German, French, and Arabic and typesetting wow. it in French and Arabic. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And now the, the music, is it uh, what did I understand, right, that you're using also traditional instruments? No, we're just using mm -hmm. piano and um, percussion, but it's inspired by these um, traditional uh, instruments, which is why I'm using some, um, I don't know, non-traditional uh, playing techniques for parts of it, um, mm -hmm. so that you have this feeling of kind of these traditional sounds. Mm -hmm. um, the kanon and the santor are the two instruments in particular that he, he really kind of explored the sound with and tried to recreate those on uh, by using the, 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 the violin in some different ways and also the piano with the percussion. Okay. And how many stories do you have now? I think we have, it's either seven or nine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd have to look. Um, we've published, we published two and this is going to be our third. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, there are several more. Uh, I think we actually have nine. Okay. Yeah. And now you you have a, a GoFundMe and or a, a you you raising money. And what, exactly. what what is the money for? We need to record. We need to record the music, and we need to print a hardcover book, which is not a. You saw that we did these little kind of soft cover books for the yeah. first two, and that's nice, and um, and it's much more. Uh, inexpensive way to do it, but we really want this to be a big, colorful, um, impressive hardcover book, and that is just a different different price category. So, um, in order to both record it in the concert house um, and also then print it properly and in the quality that we want, we're raising money right now. We've um, uh, we make it campaign that is on till the end of this month, so I think we have nine days left. Um, we were again given the Bank Austria Kunst Prize, so that's great. We're 73 or 74 percent funded now. We've got a little ways to go. Um, and Rima has been amazing, it, it, amazingly supportive with this too, because I don't know if you know, I mean, I'm sure you know how we, we, we make it works, but you don't just give money. I mean, you can, people can just anonymously donate or just donate, but most of the things you do against rewards. So she oh, yeah. made hand um, painted little postcards um with your name in arabic you can get it personalized with your name in arabic um little bookmarks with a tassel that are kind of inspired by the story and she's just released three of these little guys so one of the things that comes up in the story is that every time there's kind of a major scene you see a little bird oh wow um, and so this is the little bird and she put my daughter's name is zoe so zoe is here regularly oh, and then cute. here in Arabic. And so she, she'll wow. make three of these for the for the rest of the campaign. So we'll be releasing that reward um, uh, today or tomorrow. That beautiful. Yeah. Yes. And, and the more jobs are for you too. Yeah. yeah. And, and the bird is part of the story. I mean, the, or, or, or you you make it part of, of the whole. It's it's also it's also the 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 little thing you can notice or not notice if you yeah. don't look uh, well enough. It always appears somewhere on the in the picture because I, I used to love such kind of stories where there is something yeah. like a, like a follow the 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 like the sing along yeah. with the with the ball. So it's it's the bird that always is watching somewhere. It appears somewhere and it goes through all the pages. And that's that's in a lot of children's books. You have the kind of a little yeah. animal that kind of appears, and I think it's just yeah, it's fun for them to, to look for and um, makes it more accessible for all ages. This is a clever project. I love it. <laughs> Very excited <laughs> about it. Yeah, we are. So it's it's mm -hmm. the whole the whole procedure is it's, is it's incredible, yeah. just, but it's yeah. so much fun. Yeah. It's really really yeah. fun. Now I think it's you know it 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 has so many um, qualities to to do so many things you know and like you say it's uh, there's there's all these I think as as you saying I like this little bird I think there's hidden advantages also on this project that I think that that would work so I think it would be a good investment if if somebody 
yeah, sp sponsors it and, and so on. But do you still do concerts for it? Yes, we do. Um, at least in the pandemic, not so many, but this yeah. uh, Tailspin has been at home in like the, the Märchenwache festivals in Germany. Um, obviously, the Musikverein I mentioned. Um, the Rathaus. The Rathaus, yeah. We were at the, they, they do this uh, fairy tale days and we were there. Uh, several different different years performing. So yeah, Tailspin does still perform. I'm looking for ways to have kind of the next generation maybe take up the mantle. Um, we have a wonderful little, uh, not little, she's an adult woman, uh, intern coming as a Fulbrighter. Um, and she's going to uh, work on kind of cultural outreach. And I'm hoping we'll be instrumental in bringing Tailspin to um, you know, uh, a more or figuring out what ways that tailspin stories could be um, performed by people other than us. You know, how we yeah. could, we could manage that and maybe have a tailspin franchise where we have people kind of in, in different places who have access to this yeah. material and are getting um, this wonderful music and these wonderful stories and art out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, really, honestly, it's a great concept to introduce music and, and art to children, you know, and uh, I think that's absolutely a great idea. It's a, it is a concept, you know, that you have here. That's great. Yeah. But, um, oh, and, and you're a pianist and, and where, how did your journey start as a pianist? You know, I, I most pianists, of course, start very young. So I started out as a concert pianist and I got my undergraduate degree in New York um, and then realized about two years and I did not like spending all my time alone. I just am not I'm, I'm too social to play for eight hours a day. And also it's just a really lonely existence being um, a soloist. And so I really kind of had a bit of a crisis already in my second year um because I I'd extensively made it you know I'd, I'd gotten into the big conservatory and I was doing fine and then you when you see though what the possibilities are afterwards you really and you start to know yourself but and they don't match that's really kind of disconcerting I think people have probably experienced similar things during the pandemic where we've had to look very hard at what we're doing and why um and fortunately I had a wonderful mentor there who kind of pulled me aside and said, you're destined to do chamber music and art song accompaniment and play with people. And you're going to be great at that. And you're going to love it. And I, I want, I want you to, to move in this direction. So I actually had the opportunity to move to Italy and study opera coaching um, at La Scala and I do chamber music there. And then I got a Fulbright um, teaching fellowship and came to Vienna. Um, and started studying chamber music and art song accompaniment and opera coaching. And then I stayed. I've been in Vienna now since 2000. And um, I added a PhD in musicology to those things. And now split my time between playing concerts and, and writing and thinking about music at the University of Music here. And it's a dream. It's just an wow. awesome. Yeah. But you see, there you found your thing, you know? Yeah. And and if you can't find it, if the thing doesn't make, I think what making things like like a um, tailspin and I also had a, a, a strange concert series for six years where we combined song with all sorts of different things. And I think you spoke to the Freestyle Orchestra. I also play with, with them and do okay, some circus yeah. art with them. But I think if you don't see yourself in the system that is there, like I didn't see myself as a solo pianist and um, and there's been different times where it's like, well, I could do that, but I just don't, it doesn't feel like me then you just make something that feels more like you. And then other things kind of appear too. Um, yeah. I think that's um, served me very well, at least. And, and it's just fun to that Tailspin is still kind of um, up and running. Our first violinist, I had my Icelandic um, friend with whom I started, she went in a very different direction at a certain point. And now I work with a wonderful violinist named Joanna Lacroix, uh, mm -hmm. who's half French, half, half Austrian, who sadly... Couldn't be here today because she's playing a gig and moving. Um, but uh, it's just wonderful to see how these kind of projects accompany us and change and and change as we change um, and what kind of other doors they open as well. Yeah, because I think what you're saying is so true that sometimes you think there is just this one way and, and you have to do it. And, you, and there's also this pressure, I think, on 
artists and and especially on musicians and i think the same with ballet dancers as well you know that you have to go this specific route to be able to have this feel this value you know and and it's not always so it's not and and like you say i think over the pandemic people have questioned this a lot and um and realize that there is a life out there you know yeah, and I think I would just really encourage people too, because I think with the young people I know mentor too, there there is so much concern about not seeing how they fit into a system or not identifying with kind of the system as they understand it. And I think that's fine to have. I really think that it's fine not to feel like you you fit particularly. And I think we need diverse um, kind of approaches. And I, I mean, if I if someone had asked me when I was back in my undergraduate Eastman, like, where do you see yourself ideally in 10 years? I certainly wouldn't have said what I'm doing today. But my dream then was, is much less interesting than where I ended up. So I think a lot of it is just oh. trusting your instincts and kind of trying to bring your own specific voice into the world to, and, and see how it develops. And then seeing what kind of doors um, there's open because of it. And I do think it's a much more interesting way to, to, to go yeah. through the artist's journey. <laughs> but I mean, there, Rima, you, you can also probably say that your first dream was probably to, to design the biggest, most spectacular building. And now you are doing much yeah. more valuable work, really. <laughs> that's, that's true. And, and when I think when... I started with the porcelain is actually when I stayed at home with my firstborn boy mm -hmm. and I thought, okay, it's lovely to be a mother, but I need to do something <laughs> when the baby sleeps. So this is how the whole painting thing started. And then I discovered that actually this is what I want to do until the last day of my life. This I want to be sitting there with my brush and my brushes and my colors and, and just painting. If it's on, on paper, if it's uh, on porcelain or on glass, it's, it's, it's the thing I really love doing. And I put so much thought in it because it's, it's not just the end product, what you see. There is always this research and especially from my, uh, coming from, from uh, Iraq and Mesopotamia and this, this rich civilization that hardly anyone thinks of when you say Iraq. So this put an additional responsibility on me or it became, it became a devotion that turned to a mission that I have to, to keep on doing and hope to get also other people joining in, in this. Yeah. Well, it is like that. Um, those are the things that count in the end. You know, these and these little messages that you have in your work, it's, um, you know, it's the things that I think touch, touch people. It's not always the big, the big bang things, you know, the, the, Absolutely, yes. <laughs> it's these, it's these yes. things that I think that's the important things uh, that, that you're doing. So, Congratulations, both of you, really. Thank you. Thank you. This lovely project, I, um, I, I think it's great work. I wish for you that you, um, you know, that this, that you raise enough money to, to, um, you know, to do all the things that you want to do, and that this project have, uh, so that it gets feet, so that it goes all over the world. Because I've been, you know, I've been talking to a lot of South African artists and it's there the same thing. Uh, they are so frustrated because art is not valued there. And how do you get people to value it? And, and you start with children, you know, you start with them. And I can just see this is a lovely project that goes to South Africa. And when you start going to stories, there's a lot of stories there as well. I have heard actually. Yeah. yeah. If you have any that you think um, we should be aware of, please feel free to send them our way. I'm always I will do so, definitely. Definitely. Because I think this this project could be very nicely implemented there as well. Now I would love to hear, apart from this project, what are your wishes for the future? Woo! There's wow, that's a that's a big question, Petra. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I hope that, especially I think 
post pandemic, I think I, I hope that we come back to an understanding of how valuable art is and also make art more suitable in certain ways to the world we actually live in. Um, that's one of my, my concerns, I think, as a historical musicologist and as a classical musician is that yeah, I do think that we live in kind of these bubbles sometimes and don't feel the need to really do things that are functional, things that, um, that are accessible and that are pleasurable and that, are, um, that enrich people's lives in a way that they just kind of feel. Um, I think that everything has to be highly, highly intellectualized and therefore unfun. Yeah, I think yeah, that we, exactly. we, you know, we tend to lose a little bit the idea that you can have something that's really, really pleasurable and enjoyable and it's also important and mm -hmm. it's also a value. Um, yeah, I guess that's my, my global wish a little bit. How about you? Yeah, well, it's it's actually my, my own um, saying, uh, but also that that goes for everything that we go back more to to cherish our roots mm -hmm. from yeah. what we raised, uh, what we were raised to, what our parents and grandparents were raised to, and turn them into wings and take off with them. So, mm -hmm. so turn the roots into into wings, not to not to lose this beautiful details we humanity once once had because if you look back in in all the cultures there's so much uh, nice uh, worthy uh, details that are somehow getting lost with all this also beautiful developing technology and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not uh, yeah I'm, I, I appreciate that also but still to to use uh, what we what we have um, in, yeah. In I, yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, I'm I'm Afrikaans and come from South Africa and I lived in the UK and I live here now. And for me, I see even with my children that this cult, the culture that, that I knew um, and that they feel comfortable with is also important. And that makes them part of who they are wherever we go. You know, it, we, we fit in and, and we settle in and, and where we are and we accept this culture, but it's part, every person has their culture as, as part of them. And it's beautiful. It's really making, it, enriching the world. Mm -hmm. And yesterday I spoke to a, a violist who is also talking about tra tra uh, traditional Chinese instruments that they want to know. Um, combine uh, with classical instruments and how wonderful, how wonderful that we can now learn from each other and learn from these cultural things that, like you say, that are sometimes hidden and the media uh, gives us one impression of a country um, and not the beautiful things that we can gain from, from this culture, you know. I think that it, we are in a place that, <laughs> geopolitically right now where people are very much in their own kind of corners, you know, mm -hmm. too much and, and looking at things that are different as being scary or being, um, yeah, other. And I do think that, I mean, I like you, I've traveled and lived a lot of different places and there are so many more things that connect us. There are so many more things that yeah. we really have in common. And I think celebrating those things and celebrating those those beautiful differences too, like the different ways people experience the the world through their that shows through their storytelling, through music, through through art, and I think that's just something that um, that we need to remember to celebrate more than be than be frightened exactly. of. Or, mm. Yeah, wary of. Yeah, no, I I totally agree. If I mean, if you think of a of an orchestra or a but like a ballet company and how many different cultures are there and yet they do one one thing and they do art you know and there's no they don't distinguish then and yeah. if we can use art in this way bringing people together like we do with food you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can do with music as well yeah. listen this was so lovely to talk to you okay now i still have one question yeah. can you do a shout out for your favorite restaurant or coffee shop in vienna oh mm. i have so many oh dear 
Um, where, where do you go most frequently or, or? Do you know one place that's it's small? Um, you are Dan and Ludwig, right by the Musikverein. Um, it's in the, I think the Kunst, is it the Kunst? Oh, so the Kunta. There's a museum right by and a theater, Stadtkino. That's where it is. In the Stadtkino, there's a wonderful little kind of cafe restaurant. They always have a wonderful Mittag's menu. And I'm always in the city either researching something at the Musikverein archives or at the National Library or at my office. And I will go there for lunch probably three times a week. And they have wonderful vegetarian food. They have wonderful non-veg. Um, and they're just a lovely, lovely little um, cafe in the center of Vienna. Um, wow, I've never been there. What's what's the name? Ludwig und Adele. So Ludwig okay. Ludwig and, and Adele. And yeah. Adele. Oh, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to go there. Look Definitely. That. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 And Rima, you? Well, I'll I'll my shout out goes to the Orientals in Vienna, and yeah. one is from. My taste really the best brunch and breakfast in Vienna is Kent in the oh, Brunnengasse. So yeah. Really? The, it's because they, they have three or four, but the best is really the, the Kent and they have delicious sweets and uh, Turkish coffee. Mm. And one Iraqi restaurant, it's called Miwan. It's in the Taborstrasse mm. at the end of the Taborstrasse. And if you want to taste the real the real, if of course, if you are uh, you eat meat, the real Iraqi kebab you find it there, and they have the best bread. But they have also a lot of other things that goes for vegetarians, like the whole yeah, vegetable <laughs> dishes. I'm from, I'm from South Africa. I eat meat. <laughs> <laughs> you were there last week. I was there with my daughter. Right by Schweiglerstraße U3. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's, it's I'm going to I'm going to go to these two places, yeah. But I'm going to put their links in the description, and um, so that that uh, yeah, so that if people want to go and visit them, they can go. Thank you so much. You're doing such wonderful work, both of you. And um, I hope maybe we meet in person one day. We're, I'd love we're, that. we're talking on Zoom, but we're both in Vienna, but or all three in Vienna. But yeah, then maybe we'll meet that. for a coffee. Yeah. Have a lovely afternoon. And thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye.